Let's consider now the vapor pressure of a liquid. We learned from Chemistry 105 that we can determine the average speed of a gas particle and we saw that if we took the kinetic energy equation written in these two forms, one in terms of speed and one in terms of temperature, we can solve for the root mean square speed of a gas particle. And so we see that as the temperature goes up, the average speed of the particle goes up. So we can use this, apply this, to liquids and their vapor pressures. So if we have a liquid here, then the liquid particles are being held to each other by the intermolecular attractions, either dispersion forces or dipole-dipole interactions or ion-dipole interactions. So they're being held by these intermolecular forces together. If the intermolecular forces are great enough, the density of the substance becomes great enough that the liquid phase will form. If we look at the distribution of speeds for a gas particle, we get a curve that looks like this. So this is the most probable speed here at the maximum, but we see that there is a distribution of speeds. So we have the most probable and we can calculate the average and one thing to notice though is that there are a few particles that have speeds that are much greater than the most probable or the average. The average is close to the most probable here. And so there are a few particles that are actually have a lot more kinetic energy or a lot higher speeds than the average. And so in this liquid, there are a few particles that have enough energy to break these attractions and get out of the liquid phase into the gas phase. So we have some particles that get up here into the gas phase. Well, they have enough energy to break the attractions holding them into the liquid phase. So a liquid will have a vapor pressure, meaning some liquid particles can actually get to the vapor phase. And to get to the vapor phase, they have to push the air away because air is sitting on top of this liquid. So it has to push the air away in order to make room for the gas particles from the liquid. So this is called the vapor pressure. The pressure exerted by the vapor coming out of the liquid phase. Now if we look at the vapor pressure of a liquid, versus temperature, we will get a, a curve that looks like this. It's exponential. So as the temperature increases, the vapor pressure increases. Because as the temperature increases, the root mean square speed of the particles increases, and so more particles have enough energy to break out of the liquid phase into the gas phase. So the vapor pressure rises as the temperature rises. Now we can quantify this 
by the following expression. So we have the pressure of the vapor above a liquid is equal to a constant, I'll call beta, times E to minus delta H vaporization divided by RT power. So this is the enthalpy of vaporization of the liquid. R is the ideal gas constant. T is temperature. Here, since delta H is an energy, R would be in energy units, joules per Kelvin per mole. So a more convenient form of this equation to use is to take a ratio at two different temperatures. So let's take the ratio of this equation at temperature 2 and temperature 1. That's temperature 2, and I'll divide by the vapor pressure at temperature 1. So I'll call this T2 and T1, as long with vapor pressure at temperature 2, vapor pressure at temperature 1. So you can see that the constant beta will cancel, so we don't have to worry about this proportionality constant. And if we combine the exponentials, we will get the following equation. And I'll factor out negative delta H vaporization over R. So this is a convenient form of the equation. And if I took the natural log of both sides of the equation, then I would get this form. <coughs> These are two forms of the same equation, and you'll use one or the other depending on what you're trying to solve for. So what this gives us is a way to say we know the vapor pressure at temperature 1. So we know P1 and T1, and we can look up enthalpy of vaporization in a table, and we want to know what the vapor pressure is at T2. So we know P1, T1, we pick our T2, and we can solve for the pressure at temperature 2. So we'll know the vapor pressure at temperature 2. Here, if we know the two vapor pressures, we can solve for one of the temperatures. So these are two forms of the same equation. This is called the clausius clapeyron equation. And it equates the vapor pressure of a liquid at different temperatures. So now let's define the boiling point of a liquid. So say we have our beaker of some particular liquid here, and we have some liquid getting into the gas phase. So here, my gas phase here, so I have some gas phase particles, and it has a particular vapor pressure because this gas vapor here exerts a pressure against the atmosphere sitting on top of it to move it away in order for these particles to get from the liquid to the gas phase. It has to push the atmosphere away. It has to exert a pressure. So we have a vapor pressure of the liquid. Now, as we increase the temperature, more particles 
are able to escape the liquid phase, and so we have more gas here, and so the vapor pressure will increase, and the point at which the vapor pressure equals the external pressure is defined as the boiling point. So let's draw this again. So we have our liquid. We have air exerting a pressure on the top of the liquid, atmospheric pressure at sea level. In order for the liquid to get out of the liquid phase and into the gas phase, it has to push that air away. So we have some liquid going into the gas phase. And it has to exert a pressure in order to push the air away. And the point at which the vapor pressure equals the external pressure or the air pressure then that's defined as the boiling point. So if we have water on our stove and we decide to boil it, we start heating the water up and we have one atmosphere of air pressure sitting on top of our liquid water. So when the vapor pressure of our water is equal to one atmosphere, the air pressure sitting on top, then the water will start boiling. That's the boiling point. And the normal boiling point is when the vapor pressure equals one atmosphere. So that would be the boiling point at sea level. Now if we go to the top of a mountain, the air pressure is slightly less <clears throat> than one atmosphere. If we go to the top of Mount Everest, it's a lot less than one atmosphere. So the boiling point of water on top of a mountain will be lower in temperature than it is at sea level because the air pressure is less and so the vapor pressure has to be less of a liquid in order to reach the air pressure. So it'll boil at a lower temperature.